My plan tonight is to just talk about invasive aquatic plants. And this is um, a bit of a departure from what I've been doing lately because I've been um, talking a lot of the past couple of years about the um, threat of invasive animals as well. But I'm just gonna focus on what we have here in Maine, um, what to keep an eye out for and, um, and just plants, which I think is, um, is fine. And the reason that I have this aquarium shot was on purpose. Um, many of the invasive aquatic plants that we have in Maine, um, we believe were actually brought to this country as aquarium plants. They're very hardy. Some of them are very attractive. Um, and so people would have them in their aquariums and then when their fish died or whatever, they would just pour the water out. And, um, and at least a couple of the ones from um, Eurasia, there was, that's basically how, how they got here. So um, it's now illegal to buy or sell or own or any of those plants um, in the state of Maine, but um, cat's out of the bag at this point. So what am I gonna do? Um, I'm gonna talk a little bit about why we care about invasive species. I do feel like um, many, people on our list, both our boat inspectors, CBI coordinators, LEA members, hopefully um, get this message from us a lot. This is a, this is a very big program that we do at LEA. So I hope that some people have at least a little bit of a background, but I'll talk about that. Talk about what we've got. Um, I'll talk about the 11 most unwanted, um, which is a very specific plant list. And then lastly, I'll talk about what to do if you find a suspicious plant this summer. Okay, so what do they do? I'll compete native species for space and food. Um, they often have very aggressive growing tactics. They might um, come up earlier in the spring. They might produce seeds. I'm gonna talk about the different strategies, um, but they also don't have any predators. So that's a really big, a big part of it is if nothing's eating you, and you don't have any natural diseases or checks and balances in this new environment, uh, yeah, you're just gonna keep growing um, and not stop. Um, grow and spread rapidly. So unlike native plants that might, like they might have a good year or two where there's like a big boom, um, but then they'll have years where they're kind of laid back and not as, as, um, as growy, but uh, these invasives, they just, every year, there's more and more space taken up. They never just like get less. Uh, interfere with boating, fishing, and swimming. Um, yeah, so there's, there's lakes in other states that um, you can't boat anymore. It's closed. Um, and the plants around the boat launches are so thick that, that you just can't get a motor through them. Um, and then you can imagine swimming in, in thick plants would not be um, good. Uh, I do get the argument quite a bit from bass fishermen that plants are good for bass habitat, which technically is true. Um, they, they're like milfoil's great because it's habitat. Um, but there's a fine line between like having a little bit of milfoil that provides a nice habitat, but then if you let it go completely, um, it starts impacting uh, water quality is the next one, where these plants, they grow and die and grow and die, and they can cause um, eutrophication of the lake. So when you have too many nutrients in the lake, it causes algae blooms, it can cause oxygen to drop in the lake. So, um, you know, a little bit of milfoil, maybe the bass like it, uh, but if you let it go, then that habitat is eventually destroyed. So, I mean, yeah. And then also, and I'm not going to get into this argument, but bass are also not native to Maine. Fun fact. So uh, there's that argument as well. Um, eradication is seldom possible. So we talk about prevention, prevention, prevention all the time. And this is one of the reasons why um, I like it that people are coming to this presentation uh, because the more eyes we have on the water, the more eyes we have on these plants, uh, the faster we can find new infestations or prevent infestations. Uh, and then that makes, makes everything go smoother. And then if people don't care about any of those other things, 
um, which hopefully they do. And if you live on an infested lake, it also drops your property values. Um, very uh, case in point is Lake Arrowhead in Waterboro. Um, their property values, I believe, dropped like between 20 and 30 percent in the first five years of their infestation, um, which has not gotten any better. So uh, it's certainly a concern for the wallet as well. And obviously, if we lose property values on lakes, then our tax revenue goes down and you can yeah, connect the dots there. So not all aquatic plants are, are bad. Um, they're a food source for our native um, animals, habitat for our native animals. Um, and they're attractive. They're just, they're, they're a food source. There we go. Um, so uh, yeah, these are native plants, which are good. And we get, we get calls all the time at LEA um, where if there's too many native plants around somebody's house, they wanna remove them. They think it's invasive, all of these things. But um, again, those native plants sometimes will grow um, pretty thick, uh, and, but they're supposed to be there. So it's good to know the difference. And here's a nice shot. This is Island Pond in Harrison um, of what a healthy ecosystem looks like. All right, I'm jumping right in. So if it's a red slide, it's an invasive plant. So if you zone out and look up and you're like, what's that? Where am I? Um, the, the red slides are ones that are invasive. Um, curly leaf pondweed. Um, this is one that we have in Maine. Uh, and it's got this very interesting vein pattern that they say is like stained glass. So it's kind of got like an outer um, edge with this kind of patterning inside of the outer edge. And it's ruffled like lasagna, curly leaf, pondweed. Um, this uh, shot here on the white tubing uh, which I believe is probably a scope for, from a Secchi disc, uh, was found actually this, this past summer um, in Maine in a new spot that, that hasn't been fully um, looked at yet. So it's not actually on the list yet, but it will be. Um, so curly leaf pondweed produces turions or winter buds, um, which allow the plant to grow in low light and survive harsh conditions. So these turions have all the material needed to create a new plant. So even if that plant is pulled up, if the turions have already developed and dropped down into the muck, um, it doesn't really matter <laughs> because um, the next year they're going to come up. And curly leaf pondweed actually grows, it'll grow under the ice. Um, before the ice is even out, it'll start. Like it can grow in that low light. Uh, and they, it is, we think about summer in very finite terms, like Memorial Day to Labor Day, but curly leaf pondweed, they actually do a lot of the control work in the fall um, because it gets, I mean, it just gets thicker and thicker into the fall. So, um, and that is found in the Kennebec River. That was, it was recently discovered in the Kennebec River, which as you can imagine is not great because it's flowing. Um, Legion Pond and West Pond are both small ponds in Maine, um, not terribly frequented. And last year it was found in a stream that connects North Pond and East Pond up in the Belgrades. Um, but that again, hasn't been fully explored yet. So it's not on the list yet. Um, this is our list. This Mayor, is our, yes. Can you, um, there's like a number of native pond weeds too, right? Yes, I'm going to do that. I'm going to get to that. Okay, thanks. I got it. Yeah. So um, I do. Yeah, I will go. I will look at the lookalikes as well. I just wanted to show off this map. Um, this is new. This just came out a couple weeks ago. Um, so the curly leaf pondweed is the yellow triangles. Um, so it's not really in a lot of places in Maine. Um, but yeah, and we want to keep it that way. All right, pondweed lookalikes. So we've got variable pondweed. Um, which under the water, one of the leaf types, which are these long ones, um, do can look a little bit like 
curly leaf pondweed, although they have just straight edges, they don't have that curly edge. Um, so once you kind of get it in your hand, you can be like, okay, so you can eliminate that. And the reason it's called variable pondweed, and there's a couple that do this, they have two different leaf types. So if you like pulled up the plant or you saw a leaf on the top, it kind of looks like a lily pad, um, but it's actually um, a pondweed and it's got a different leaf type underneath. White stem pondweed. Um, so this has kind of a cur curvy um, uh, leaf, but it doesn't have that stained glass pattern. So it doesn't have that segmented pattern inside the leaf. Uh, and, it and it has this very interesting kind of um, staggered alternate leaved look. Uh, and then clasping leaf pondweeds are clasping. <laughs> So the, um, the leaf actually wraps around the stem and that's pretty unique to those clasping leaves. So these, the blue slides are native. So these are native plants that we like, we want them in the water. Um, so you're gonna leave those. All right, next invasive. This is a bad one. I mean, they're all bad, but this one's really bad. Um, European naiad slash brittle water nymph. I never know what to call it um, because I hear people calling it both things all the time. Um, the European makes sense because it's from Europe, but the brittle makes sense because it breaks apart really easily. So it's very interesting. Um, so small leaves, the leaves are serrated and you can kind of see that on the, um, the picture on my right not in the water. You can see the serrations. Um, and it spreads by seeds. Uh, and the stat is one acre of plants can produce tens of millions of seeds. And the seeds are uh, just one to three millimeters long. Um, so this is a problem. And it is um, found in a few places in Maine. Northeast Pond is pretty popular. Lake Arrowhead is a very popular um, fishing lake. So this is a huge concern this year and they're gonna be trying to do, tackle this this year because um, those seeds, man, once those seeds get out, I mean, if, you get in, if it gets into, your, um, into the water in your um, boat, even, even kayaking, even non-motorized vessels, the seeds can stick to the side. It's, it's, um, it's a really bad one. And then Legion Pond and Salmon Falls River, those are, those are smaller places. They're not frequented really. Um, so it's not as much of a concern as far as spreading. Um, but I will say this a couple times. And I don't know if anybody's from Lake Arrowhead, but I would just not. I would just not go to Lake Arrowhead if you can avoid it. Um, and I'll talk about why. This is one of the reasons, and there's two other reasons. So um, this is a clump of naiad that I picked out of Lake Arrowhead last summer. Um, I got as much as I could reach, but uh, it grows really thick. Um, so just for um, reference, these blue, the blue stars um, are the brittle water nymph. So they're pretty clumped down in the south here. Naiad lookalikes, slender naiad. And I'm going to talk a little bit more about slender naiad because that's like the biggie um looks a lot like it and um and then slender pondweed it can it looks like it when you're just kind of looking at down into the water but as soon as you pull it up the leaves are really long they're very thin they don't have any serrations or teeth along the edges at all um and they just kind of become grass-like um when you when you get it into your hand slender naiad is a different story um, and this in slender night is pretty common in our um, in our local lakes. So this is a comparison shot that I got last year. Native is on the left, invasive is on the right. Um, so you can see that the presentation of the plant is is very similar. It's kind of got this. Um, I almost think of it as like fireworks pattern, um, where the leaves kind of get thicker as you go up. And, um, you know, and 
the invasive one is slightly darker in this picture, but that can vary. Uh, so it is, um, yeah, it's, it's a tough one. Um, and for my purposes, so the, the book says um, the slender naiad has really, really fine serration. So that's the, the teeth on the, on the um, leaf and the leaves are like maybe an inch long. Um, and then the um, brittle water nymph has kind of spikes. And I did take this picture since I had both specimens. I was like, I got to get this right next to each other. Um, so with this right next to each other, you can definitely see without any kind of magnifying um, aid, you can actually see the teeth here, the spikes coming off of the European naiad and the slender naiad has tiny little ones, but really to see them clearly, you have to have a magnifying glass. So I will say with this, and I'm gonna say it again, um, if you have any question, if you find something, just ask, grab a sample, bring it in, take a picture. Um, especially with these, we do not wanna mess around with Niad. We don't wanna leave anything to chance. Um, so, and I found that slender naiad in a large patch in, um, beaver pond in Bridgeton and I got all freaked out. So I had to take all kinds of samples and, and we worked it out that it was slender naiad, but, um, it looks very similar in water. Mary. Yeah. The European naiad, Sean is asking, is there a point when the seed is not produced or growing where mitigation crews could pull the plants without the chance of the seeds dropping and spreading? Um, early in the season. So the seeds develop in kind of late summer, like August time. Um, so we try to do some pulling, but to, to be perfectly honest, and they haven't started this on Arrowhead, but I think they probably will. Um, the infestation in Northeast Pond, they're using herbicides almost exclusively. Um, which so to spread the herbicides over like a whole patch and and it just kills it right away before it can produce those seeds and um and they just keep and then they just keep doing it northeast pond it's a it's a joint effort between the state of maine and the state of new hampshire because it it's in both both states so they've been um, doing that for several years using herbicides so the management plan has not been worked up for arrowhead yet they're still surveying um but if you hand pull at the beginning of the season you can get that plant but it also i mean its other name is brittle water nymph so it also can if you aren't very very careful it just breaks apart so um and those smaller fragments can cause problems so um it's a tough one it's a tough one um and knock on wood we haven't found it in our service area, um, but we're gonna keep our eyes peeled because you gotta catch it young. Um, hydrilla is another one that um, has primarily been treated via with um, herbicides and same kind, same, it's not seeds, um, but I mentioned the turions for the curly leaf pond weeds. So they produce seed like um, things uh, that drop down into the into the mud and can withstand anything I mean they can they can dry out they can be eaten and not I mean I haven't tried it but by wildlife um, and they can freeze and, and all kinds of things so um, hydrilla before I learned about Niad, I thought hydrilla was the worst <laughs> invasive plant that we could have in Maine um, and I was wrong but hydrilla is also treated with herbicides and we actually, um, it's only found in one place in Maine now, which means that we have um, Damariscotta Lake was on the list and came off the list this year. They treated it with herbicides for several years in Damariscotta Lake and I guess they haven't found any for a couple of years. And then um, Pickerel Pond in Limerick also had a really bad infestation of hydrilla, I think I think they did herbicide treatments for like 10 years um, to, to beat that down. And that has, that just came off the list as well. So it can, it's possible um, in small, like a smaller places on Damariscotta Lake, it was in a little cove and they literally just put a physical barrier between the cove and the rest of the lake so that they could um, get rid of it. 
But um, so <clears throat> a key on this, and I'm going to talk about the native species next, but um, so a whorl, <laughs> it's a fun word to say, you can say it in your head. A whorl um, is uh, the leaves uh, arrangement around the stem. So if you have a whorl of leaves and you can see it, you just kind of have this arrangement of leaves around the stem. And hydrilla has four to eight leaves in a whorl. So if you count each, this picture has five. Um, and we have some at the office at LEA. Most of them have four or five. Um, but you kind of count the leaves in the whorl around the stem. Uh, and that's a really important indicator is the number of leaves around a whorl. Um, and then they're just found in this one place. Um, it's um, 32 Woolwich ponds. And these are just kind of small private ponds. So it's not some place, I, I don't even know if you can put a, a motorboat into these. So it's, um, it's, not, it's not a huge threat, uh, I'll say. Uh, at this point. And we always are keeping an eye out and we always want to be aware, um, but it's not, um, you know, there's not a bunch of people coming out of their motorboats that we have to worry about. Hydrilla lookalikes. That's a good one. Um, common water weed. There it is. It looks very, very similar. Um, they're in the same um, family. But, and this is a key, and this is really important, and hopefully everybody's paying attention because this common water weed comes up a lot and people bring it in a lot. And I love that people bring it in a lot to the, to the office because it does look so much like hydrilla. But native water weeds, and there's a couple different species, but they look very similar, um, have three leaves per whorl, like every time. Um, so if you take a cross section um, of the stem and you count all the leaves in the world, you're going to get, you're going to come up with three um, almost every time. And so you just count the leaves in the world. If you have more than three, then you start to be like, Ooh, maybe this isn't great. Um, and, uh, but if you have three consistently, it's native, um, which is good, but water weed, it can grow in thick patches. Um, we've had people send send pictures, alarming pictures, because it looks so thick. And um, it wasn't like this last year. And then it then the next year is not like it, you know. So it it it'll go through a boom and bust, whereas the invasive um, counterpart would just always be booming um, and wouldn't die back. And then the other hydrilla lookalike, which really isn't. Um, but I had to put more than one picture on here, um, is mare's tail. And it, you know, kind of looks like it uh, in form, but then if you get a, um, if you get a cross section, it's just got a ton of leaves in a whorl. So hydrilla is like, it's four to, four to seven or four to eight, but it's really kind of averages around five. Um, but mare's tail always has 11. Um, leaves in a whorl. So once you get that cross section, it's like, okay, this doesn't look anything like it. Um, so that one's hydrilla. Um, <laughs> European frog's bit, which it's got a fun name. Um, this one was, um, it was a little alarming when, uh, when this one showed up. It's a fun story. Um, on Cobbacy Lake, they had found Eurasian water milfoil, which I'll talk about in a minute. And they were doing a survey of the whole lake to make sure that they had found all the spots with Eurasian milfoil. And then um, there was just kind of this cove and it was filled with European frogs bit. And, and they think it had been there for years and nobody had noticed it because it was kind of off the beaten track. Um, and one of the reasons for that is um, European frog's bit is free floating. It can root, but it often will just float around. Uh, so it goes where the wind blows um, and it all got blown into this one area. So um, the difference between this and our native uh, lily pads is one, it's got bunched stems. So you're going to have a bunch of um, leaves at the surface. And then if you follow their stems down, they're connected um, in a group. Um, very, they're pretty small leaves. Um, 
And then they're really only found in Cobbesee Lake. I think one supposed frog's bit plant was found in this tiny little pond in, um, in uh, Lincolnville, but uh, that was, I think, a false alarm. Um, so, and this is a, a close up of the actual plant in Cobbesee. So you can see, I call this, and the um, my counterparts at the DEP do not like it when I say this, but now I'm gonna say it in front of all these people, it's fine. Um, I call it frog's butt because, because if you look at it, it's got this very rounded bottom area. Um, and I'm gonna show you some of our native lily pads so you can see the difference, but they aren't, they don't have that nice, perfectly rounded butt. It's fine. This is being recorded. Um, frogs bit look alike. So here's a big mass of native lily pads. Um, and I do have people, oh, it's a lily pad, it's fine. And they don't, because people don't, all they talk about is milfoil. And, um, but we do have some other um, funky ones. So frogs bit look alike. So first we've got our um, spatter dock, which is those huge leaves. Um, so the big leaved um, lily pads uh, that that show up here and they have that yellow knob flower. So that's batter dock. Um, and it really isn't much like it, but I talk about the lily pads because um, they're much bigger. Um, water shield is pretty small, uh, but they are perfectly symmetrical. They're these beautiful little ovals. And the stem for that actually comes right out of the middle, um, going all the way down. So if you're out in your kayak or your boat, um, these are the things to look for. Fragrant water lily um, goes kind of all, all the way around. It's kind of got the shape, but it's pointy. So if you look at the edges um, where that gap is, it's got these pointy, edges and those are, are generally bigger than our um, than the frogs bit. The one that really comes up and you have to pay close attention to is um, little floating heart. And because this one, the the leaves are I think between like three and seven um, centimeters, which is very on track, kind of similar to the frogs bit. But if you look at the shape of the leaf, so that's the frog's bit there with that curved rounded bottom. Um, and then compare that to the little floating heart, which really almost comes to a point and, um, and the pieces of the leaves do not meet. So once you kind of get a feel for it and look at a lot of these things over and over again, um, then you can you can start to recognize the, the small differences and the big differences. Um, but I always say if you find a lily pad, especially a small lily pad, just bring it into the office, send a picture um, so that we can rule rule this out. And then it would be a lot of work and possibly impossible. But if you could get under the water and take one, one lily pad and follow the stem all the way down, each one of our native lily pads has its own stem. They're not gonna be connected under the water. Um, they do get tangled up, so it might look like they are connected, um, but they do each have their own stem that goes down. Um, not the easiest thing to see, but if you were out snorkeling, um, Okay, right, we're gonna get to the milfoils here, but I wanna talk about leaf type. Um, you've got three different types of leaves on our, um, our submerged leafy plants. Um, fork divided, branch divided, and feather divided. All milfoils, both invasive and native, have the feather divided leaves. So if you get one in your hand and you can get an individual leaf, it's gonna look like a feather. Um, and the number of whorls around a stem can um, make a difference as well. And then invasive milfoils have flowers that come above the surface um, and those are gonna have 
leaves associated with the flowers around the, around the stem. Um, but I am going to say milfoils, it's tough. It can be tough, um, a tough one. So always bring that one in as well. But we've got two invasive milfoils in Maine. One is Eurasian water milfoil. Um, and this one, I, I think it's kind of a beautiful plant. I don't want it anywhere, but um, it's got three to six leaves per whorl. Um, and the space, we call it the internodal space. Um, so just on the stem, the space between the whorls um, is pretty large compared to um, uh, the, other mil the other invasive milfoil that I'll talk about. And then the leaflet pair, so it's got, um, they have broken out or drawn um, a single leaf and you can see the, the little um, spines coming off of this. Uh, there's 12 to 24 leaflet pairs and Eurasian milfoil has the most of those. It's, it's gonna be, um, they just have a lot. The feather is very robust on that. And, um, and if they are flowering, and again, Eurasian milfoil is not, fortunately not common in Maine, but um, if, it, if they do flower, then the flowers are larger than the, than the leaves surrounding them. Um, but I've never seen it flower. It's pretty well controlled in the state of Maine. And it's found in, in Cobbacy. Again, Cobbacy is a bit of a nightmare as well. No offense to Cobbacy. Um, Grandin Pond and Pleasant Hill Pond, which are again, those smaller ponds um, that don't have um, a lot of public access. <sighs> Variable leaf water milfoil. And um, this is the one uh, I don't even put, I didn't even list where it's found because it's the most common invasive aquatic plant in Maine. And it's the one everybody talks about all the time, which sometimes annoys me because I want people to be talking about more than just milfoil. But this is the most common one. We do have it in our service area. Four to six leaves per world, just like the Eurasian. Um, seven to 12 leaflet pairs. So it, it's not as thick on the, on the leaf. Uh, there's not as many of those leaflet pairs. Um, the space between the whorls is um, very short. So it gives kind of a bottle brush look. So when it's underwater, it kind of looks like a bottle brush um, and it can be really thick. The red stem is typical. And it's funny that I put red stem typical because then I also decided to put this picture in. Um, when we uh, discovered or when milfoil was discovered, variable milfoil was discovered in Long Lake, uh, there was some debate about it at first because it really didn't have a red stem. And the milfoil that we had been working with in Sebago Lake and the Songo River had a very clear red stem. And, um, and in Long Lake, it didn't. But the name of the plant is variable water milfoil. So it's variable. It changes um, from place to place and uh, which is neat, but also can make it hard because people are like, oh, you know, maybe it's native and, um, and it definitely wasn't. And uh, the, the kind of the, the danger and the reason why milfoil, this milfoil is so widespread is that a plant fragment, like a few inches, it doesn't have to have the, the root or, you know, it doesn't have to be any particular part of the plant, just a few inches fragment can become a new plant. So that's why we wanna check our boat so carefully because um, any fragment in a new place can, um, can cause a new infestation. And then um, the yellow squares. So if you're looking at the map, the yellow squares is where the variable water milfoil is in the state of Maine. So it's, um, it's a lot. And we added Alamusic Lake, which is number one, it's way up in the corner here. Uh, we added that this year, Big Lake, which I'm not sure if you can see it on this, um, is down east and that was added last year. So it's, it's cropping up um, as, as more people are becoming aware and more people are doing surveys of their lakes, which is great, we want that to happen, but the more surveys are happening, uh, we're, we are discovering more, more plants. Um, but it's, it's mainly variable milfoil. And the good thing, and, and Alana might not 
feel this way since she manages our uh, plant control crew, but we've got a pretty good system down for doing that plant control. And um, variable milfoil, for the most part, we don't have to use herbicides. Um, we can do it through mechanical harvesting and, um, and it does, it's not as aggressive as, as some of those other ones, which is good. Um, the famous Peter Lowell, anybody? He was our um, executive director for a long, long time, uh, decades. And this was him in the Songo River. And this was taken several years ago, I think maybe 2005 or six, when the infestation in the river was um, really, really bad. And he just needed to show how bad it was. And you can see the flower spikes coming up. And once a infestation becomes mature, um, it's gonna send up those flowers. So like a very young new um, plant is not gonna do that. But once they've established, um, they'll do that late, late in the season. All right, milfoil lookalikes. Bladderwort, we get this one in the office a lot, which is great. I love it when people bring stuff in and, and want to know what it is. So bladderwort has branch divided leaves, so it doesn't have feathery leaves. And you can kind of see that in, um, in this close-up picture. And the, I mean, the very obvious difference is the bladders. And bladderwort is a carnivorous plant. Fun fact. Uh, so what happens, these are air-filled bladders and your little um, zooplankton is going to swim past that. Um, it triggers, there's like these little hairs and it triggers those and the pouch will open up and it'll suck in the prey. Uh, so those, the bladders are really the key. I mean, if you, if you have a plant that has these little um, dots on them, that's, it's bladderwort. It's a very common species in Maine. Uh, and there's a couple of different uh, types. But you can see in this in this picture on the left, it grows quite thickly um, and it can look quite alarming, um, but it is native um, and it is supposed to be here. Crowfoot, uh, this one's not, not quite as common as bladderwort. Um, I don't see it as much. It has a lot more like different um, habitat requirements than some of the others but it also has these branch divided leaves. So if you compare that to that perfectly symmetrical milfoil um, feather, then you can, you can really see the difference. Um, they also flower pretty readily. So we've got white crowfoot and yellow crowfoot in Maine. Um, water marigold is a problem. This one, it, it, it confuses me sometimes. <laughs> um, I took this uh, at the state park and there's milfoil in the same place. They grow in the, it really in the same habitat. Uh, and this picture really got me. I mean, I had to, I was kayaking and I took that picture from my kayak and I had to park my kayak and swim over <laughs> and see. Um, Cause it had that, that perfect bottle brush look really thick along the stem. Um, they, the water marigold will sometimes have a reddish stem as well. Uh, but if you get a close up look, it's got branched leaves. So, um, and the leaves come right off the stem. Uh, and it's, you can see that it's not feathery at all once you can get a close look at it. But just from a kayak from above, you know, you're a few feet above it. It's, uh, it can look pretty alarming when you have a, a thick patch of it like that. And then native milfoil, which is always really fun. Um, low water milfoil is native and has a reddish stem. Farwell's water milfoil can also have a reddish stem. Um, these have feather le feathery leaves. Um, the leaves look pretty much the same as the invasive milfoil. Um, there's subtle differences. I always tell people, uh, unless you're an expert, just don't, don't guess about it. Just grab a sample, take a picture of a sample. Moose Pond um, has native milfoil in it. We, we often get samples from people off of Moose Pond. Um, and you can tell the difference, uh, but it can be kind of hard. You have to see really um, some details. So 
um, leaves are in whorls and in a scattered radiating pattern. I think I have a picture of that. Um, so this one on the top, it's not in strict whorls. So you can kind of see how along the stem, you've got um, kind of some alternating leaves coming off a little bit. Whereas the invasive milfoils really have a strict um, whorl pattern. Uh, so they're all coming off of this one spot on the stem. You're not going to have a random leaf kind of sticking off. And then our native milfoil also has these fruiting bodies. Uh, and you can see right um, where the stem meets the leaflet, it has these little spiky fruits. The problem with the little spiky fruits, when they're there, it's very exciting because it's like, oh, it's native because it's got these fruits. But when they're not there, that doesn't mean much because it just might mean that it's not fruiting at that moment, right? So the absence of that feature um, doesn't necessarily, isn't really going to tell you something, but the presence of that feature does tell you that it's native, which is, um, so it's nice to see that feature and then you don't have to worry about it. Um, there is somebody, um, a gentleman named Luke Bernacki at St. Joseph's College, and he is compiling a DNA database for different invasive plants in Maine, and he's focusing on variable milfoil. So if we ever have a question about a plant species, uh, we can send a plant sample to him. He can actually sequence the DNA, compare it to the samples that he has, and tell us if it's invasive or not, um, which is a really nice um, thing that is available to us to, so that we really, really know. Um, and then this fun new thing got, got added to the list this year. I actually, because it just got added to the list, um, I don't know a lot about it. So parrot feather is primarily emergent. So it has um, emergent leaves that are feathery. So it's got that feather divided leaf, um, but they're above the surface and they're kind of waxy. Um, and they're, they're beautiful. I mean, they're really quite pretty, uh, but they grow really thickly. They do have submerged leaves, but they're just kind of stringy and brown. Um, so they just kind of look sickly. Um, and they discovered it in a private pond uh, this fall in Liberty, Maine. Uh, and it's, I mean, they almost thought about not putting it on the list. Um, it's, it's like literally a decorative pond. Um, and they were evasive about how they got it. But it was pretty clear that somebody brought it as a, as a decorative plant for their private pond. And then it got out of control because it's an invasive species. So luckily um, there's no motorboats going in and out. There's, I don't even think there's um, passive watercraft kayaks or canoes going in and out. So that one, it doesn't pose a huge threat to us. Um, it's number 16 here off in the middle of nowhere, this blue square. Um, so, but it was, it's interesting. Um, I'm looking forward to getting some seeing some samples, seeing it in person. And it's always good to be aware of these plants. All right, so those were the ones that we have documented in Maine right now. Those ones I went through with their, with their lookalikes. This is the list of the 11 most unwanted, which is kind of a joke, but what it really is, um, is this list of aquatic, plants that it is illegal to buy, sell, propagate, um, own, have in, um, whoops, in the state of Maine. So this is on a list. The Department of Environmental Protection has this list. These are the, are the, um, the restricted plants and part of our milfoil law, which um, prevents the movement of plants around the state of Maine, uh, there's a higher fine if you have one of these found on your boat or trailer. So that's what this list is. And I'm going to talk briefly about the ones that we don't have here yet. Brazilian elodea, um, similar to hydrilla, 
It's got four leaves per whorl. So again, it looks like our common water weed, uh, but because it's got four leaves per, per whorl and our native ones have three, um, we can pretty easily tell the difference between those two. Uh, native to South America, uh, you know, you could make that assumption. And it's found all over the place, including other New England states. So it's very close to us. Uh, we have avoided it so far, and uh, it's just something to look out for. Fanwort, this was a fun happening last summer. Um, Kristen, who I don't believe is, I don't know if she's here right now. She was going to try and come, Kristen Hanscom. She is one of our um, courtesy boat inspectors, and she found fanwort um, on a boat going into Long Lake, took it off, which was amazing. Um, it was a huge save. And we believe it came from Rhode Island. Um, and it has branch divided leaves. So you're like, oh, it's got branch divided leaves, but it has handles. So if you look, this is our water marigold, which is the closest lookalike, right? Remember that. And it's got, its leaves are connected directly to the stem, um, the main stem, whereas our fan wart has two opposite leaves that have this little petiole, has a little stem. And I really literally think of them as fan handles and I can like wave them around. Um, so that was found removed from a boat and uh, which was really a really good save um, last summer. I had never seen it in person before. So, and that one's native to Europe, but again, it's quite attractive. So people, bought these things, brought them over for aquariums, private ponds, and, um, and th then spread from there. And it's found close by. And then yellow floating heart, another invasive lily pad that we, um, I, I guess there were a couple found last summer, um, but they were immediately removed. So nobody added them to any list. Uh, but very similar to the frog's bit as far as um, the, the size of the leaf and how both, like, both ends of the leaf come together. There's no space in between the edges. Uh, and it's ruffly. It's got this kind of ruffly edge to it uh, that doesn't match anybody else. And it's got a beautiful um, yellow flower, if you can see it. And just like the other uh, invasive lily pads, um, they do have multiple leaves coming off of one stem. So if you pulled it up and it's got a bunch coming off of one stem, that makes it suspicious um, immediately. And then kind of the closest-ish, um, not for the pad, but for the flower is the spatter dock, but it's, you know, the spatter dock is this um, knob and the yellow floating heart isn't. So, um, and then water chestnut, this one is, there is no lookalike. It doesn't look like anything. <laughs> it's got these crazy spade shaped leaves um, that grow in kind of a rosette and sit on the surface and has these nuts that you don't wanna step on. They're spiky, they are unforgiving. And um, they are found, in all of our other New England states. We've had a couple of scares of water chestnut coming in on boats, but um, it has not been found in, in Maine yet. The only kind of good-ish thing that I've read about it is because it doesn't necessarily root, it can be easy for like volunteers to just go around in a canoe and just grab it and, and take it out and pull it up, but it's not, it's not great. I mean, those lily pads in particular, if they grow really thickly, they're going to block all sunlight to the bottom of the lake. Um, and that obviously um, hurts the habitat underneath. So water chestnut. And then here's an orange slide. And I'm so sorry, everybody. I had to include it. I just had to because I couldn't leave it alone. Last fall, swollen bladderwort was discovered in Lake Arrowhead. So this is another pull like push for not going to Lake Arrowhead. Um, but swollen bladderwort, which is a species of bladderwort, this is it in our tank. And it's got this wild um, 
inflated rosette of leaves that sits kind of towards the surface and it's air filled and it kind of holds it up and it had this yellow flower. So this is, I went out to Lake Arrowhead to get pictures of it and just see it. Uh, and this was in, um, it was flowering, it was in October and it was flowering. So um, it's, it's pretty interesting. We've got it in our tank right now, but if you look under the water, it looks an awful lot like our native bladder warts. It's got those bladders. So if it's not flowering, um, it can look very similar to our, to our native bladder warts. And at first it was just, we were seeing one or two, and then it was just it, uh, like this whole cove was just, and they were flowering left and right. And, um, and it kept flowering in the tank. So it was, um, that was not a, not a great find. And it's native to this country, um, but it's native to the Southeast. So it, um, so yeah, so it just disturbs our habitat. So what do you do if you are suspicious? Not if you are suspicious, if you find a suspicious plant, how's that? Um, I can't help you if you are a suspicious person, but if you find something suspicious, if you find a plant in the water, take note of where you are. If you can like, if you have a GPS, if you can do a pin on your phone or in Google maps or something, take note, um, take a sample and or a picture of the plant and email the photo to me, uh, mary at mainlex.org or Alana who you got, um, some of you got this email from, for the uh, link from. So photos are great. Uh, I can often tell if something's suspicious or not based on a photo. Uh, I love getting samples as well at the office, um, at our Main Street office. And then if you find a plant on your boat or trailer, keep the sample in a, in a Ziploc with water, and then you can bring the sample to, to us or email a photo again. Uh, but if you find it in the water, and this is kind of, um, you know, sometimes people are like, oh, I saw it like in this very general vague area. So really try, if you find something suspicious in the water, really try and um, uh, document exactly where you are because then what if it's hydrilla? What if it's naiad? What if it's something? Um, we wanna be able to find that spot again. And I think, I think that's my whole spiel with seven minutes to spare. <laughs>